Hello and welcome. My name is Mark Lassoff. Today we've got another great app for you. This is a digital clock app with a twist. It also displays the current news and lets you take a closer look at any story displayed. If you're enjoying these app-based programs, please go ahead and give us a like, subscribe to the channel, and leave us a comment. Let's get started with the code. All right, so let's go ahead and first run our app. In order to do that, I'm gonna start my Python server. My command line is already pointed to the folder that contains the code for the application. So we're gonna run the simple HTTP server off the command line on port 8000. Server's running, which means now I can just go to localhost at 8000 and run our app. Looks like we need a little more screen real estate for that to work. There we go. So here you can see our app, and you can see first we've got the time ticking away, and then we've got stories down here at the bottom. So let's go ahead and take a look at the Met Gala story. We'll click on it, and it'll bring us to the story with an image and the first part of the story, which is part of the API feed that we're using. We click again, we go back. Lyft lost more than one billion last quarter. There's the story, just a picture, no story. We're kind of at the mercy of the API. And of course, that's kind of one of the dangers of API apps. If the API doesn't have good information, your app's not going to display good information. But you've got a general idea now of how this works. So now that we have our clock ticking away here, I can go ahead and show you the code. So first off, looking at the HTML, there's not a whole heck of a lot of HTML here. We've got our doc type declaration, of course, indicating that this is an HTML5 document. We've got our HTML opening tag with a closing tag on line 16. The head section of our document, a meta tag indicating the character set that we're using, title of our document, and then this kind of strange link to fonts.googleapis.com. Google Fonts is a great site to get fonts that aren't the usual fonts to use on a website. It does retrieve the fonts live when your application runs, so this only works if you have an active internet connection. So I went to the Google Fonts site, I selected a couple of fonts. Those fonts are known as Qtiv, Mono, and Noto Sans. I've also attached my own clock CSS style sheet. And then we have three logical divisions. One for the clock, up at the top. That's our clock logical division. Then we've got one for the news stories. And then this one called Detail, which only appears when we want the detail for one of the news stories. So that's detail right there. So that's our HTML, pretty simple. The CSS, likewise, is fairly straightforward. Let's take a look at that next, clock.css. And let's make also the actual application visible. So we have, first of all, our background color of black and the base color of green for everything. I wanted to give this kind of an old school CRT computer look. So that's why I use the green on black. And then for the clock section, we're aligning the text to the center. And then for our H1 content, we're using the Qtiv mono font at a font size of 200 pixels. And that's the clock itself. For the news and detail sections, we're using the font family Noto Sans. And for the detail section, I have a padding of five pixels. Each item, which is each individual news item, has a top and bottom border, one pixel wide, solid and gray, top and bottom a padding of five pixels to give some space between the edge of the area and the written content, and a bottom and top margin of zero pixels. 
that's to defeat the natural space that these have in the default style sheet. I want them to be right up against one another like this and not have space between each news story. The lines were going to separate them, not the space. All right, and the button I actually didn't use, but I forgot to take this out, so we can take out that without any harm. We have our H2 font size 2M, and that's all the CSS to give us this green screen CRT look. Very, very simple, all vanilla. And then we have, of course, our JavaScript that makes everything run. So the first thing I did was create the clock. When I'm creating applications, I like to break large problems down into a bunch of smaller problems. So instead of worrying about the clock and the news and updating it, I worry about one thing at a time. And the first thing we took care of is the clock. So I'm going to show you first how do we make the clock work. So all of these functions run, but when we start the program, these two lines run, 66 and 67 outside the function. The first thing we do is we call set interval, which runs the function display time every thousand milliseconds, so once a second. And that's essentially what's causing the time to update each second, just like that. Each time you see that updating, it's because the display time function has run. You can see it's running once a second, giving us a nice smooth update there. So Display time runs every second, and then the get news function runs. So let's look at the display time function. This is the one that's running every second. And the display time function is right here. And what that's doing is it's setting the clock div, right? That's where the clock is displayed. It's in a logical division called clock, and it's setting its inner HTML to this kind of weird string here. Now, first of all, notice the back ticks. That means I'm going to use string interpolation. String interpolation is somewhat new in JavaScript, and it lets me more easily concatenate a complex string. I don't have to constantly use the concatenation operator. Plus, in order to build a larger string, I can embed the variables and expressions right into the string, and they'll be resolved. So that's what I'm doing here. So if we start right in here, I'm going to run a function called get formatted time, and that's going to be placed inside of an H1 element. So this will be replaced with whatever the get formatted time function returns right here. So the get formatted time function will return this actual formatted time. So here's our get formatted time function being called by display time. So the first thing we do on line two is we create a new date object with the name date time. Now, when you don't send any information to the constructor of the date object, it's going to give you the current date and time. If we wanted to have a value for a date in the past or the future, we could actually send it that value in the constructor. But here, you'll notice the parentheses are empty, so we're going to get the current date and time. So we have the current date and time, and then from that object, right, date time is the current date and time, we run the get hours function to get the hours out of it, which is going to come back in military time 0 through 23. So here we said if hours is greater than 12, we're going to subtract 12, so we get this, right? So we get the appropriate value. So right now it's 1904, because it's 704, where it gives us military time. But because the hours are greater than 12, I subtracted 12, and we get 704. Then we also got the minutes. The date time object that we created has a get minutes function, and we assign that to the variable minutes. And because I wanted this to display like a normal digital clock, I had to prepend any value under 10 with a zero. You can see right now it's 704. So I added that zero here in this conditional starting on line eight. If minutes is less than 10, then minutes equals add the zero plus whatever the minutes value is. So what's being added right now is the four, which is the minutes value, and the zero 
prepending that. So that makes the time more readable, because otherwise it would say 7 colon 4, and now 7 colon 5, and then the seconds. That wouldn't make any sense. We do the same thing with the seconds. So this, if the seconds are less than zero, we prepend the leading zero to make that readable for human beings. All right, so we've used the date object and we've broken it down, gotten the hours, minutes, and seconds. So now we have our time value, which is gonna take the hours value, add a colon, the minutes value, add a colon, and the seconds value. And it's going to return that string, hours, minutes, seconds, which you see right here. So it returns the entire time string. So then it returns it here to display time, which puts that into the clock div. And again, this display time is running every second, keeping our time updated. But now we've got our news. And these news stories come from the news API. Take a quick look at that if you'd like. The news API is another one of these sites really great to practice because it's free and easy. So news API. And news API gives you access. Let's try Google searching it. Maybe it's not a .com. There we go, newsapi.org. With an API key, it gives you access to a lot of different options for news stories and news from different publishers. Now, you can't use this commercially without paying, but you certainly can use this for your practice app. If you want to pay them a little bit, then you can use it commercially. But this is a lot of fun to practice with. The other thing is it doesn't have cross-origin security, so you can actually access it directly from JavaScript. A lot of APIs have cross-origin security, which requires you to proxy the content to get around that security. No such problem here. So that's the news API, and it's returning to us a bunch of JSON. So when we initially run the application, the get news function runs. We have the API's address and the API key that was assigned to me, this newsapi.org. And in fact, if we were just to put this into the browser with my API key attached there, you can see the JSON that comes back. It looks like a mess. This is all the text that comes back that I'm using to construct the news. Something that's good to do, there's actually sites out there that allow you to view the JSON. There's actually sites out there that allow you to view the JSON more easily. So we could just paste all that junk into here and then use the viewer here and we can see it in a nice format. We can see all the different elements that are part of the JSON. So the way this JSON is constructed is we've got a node here called articles. And within the article node are each of the individual articles. It's returned 20 of them. Each article itself has a source. This one happens to be from ESPN.com. Has a title, a description, a URL, a URL to image node, a time it was published, and the content, which is the text. So each one of these article nodes has the same thing, has this information. So that's what's coming back in that kind of mess of text right here. So that's what we're requesting from the news API. The way we request it, I'm using fetch. The fetch JavaScript command allows us to fetch the information from the URL, and this returns a promise. So with the promise, we can actually get the content out of here. Now, the reason it returns a promise is we don't know how long it's going to take for the news API to actually return data to us. It could take a couple milliseconds, it could take several seconds, and the next line of code is obviously gonna run faster than that API can return information based on our request across our network and across the internet. So this then statement only runs after content has been fetched. That content is in a 
response, which we're calling RESP. And what we're going to do is we're going to change that response into a JSON object that we can parse. JSON is, of course, JavaScript object notation. So we're going to parse the JSON object, return that to this function on line 30, then, and that is now called data. I'm console logging the data here for debugging. So if we were to actually look at our application console, we access that in Chrome by going to the three dots button, more tools, and developer tools. If we look at the console, here is the object returned. So we have all of that right there. So that's why I'm console logging that out. Now it's nicely formatted like this because it's been converted to JSON. So it's here as data in the JSON format. We console log it out. And then I'm putting it into a variable called story array. I'm taking that data and putting it in story array. The reason I'm doing that is for scope. Story array will also be used down here in the display story function. So I'm creating that here to make it global for scope so I can use it in another function. So grabbing the data, storing it here. And I'm also now creating a variable called out. And I am looping through all of the articles that will return. So 0 through 19 on the right-hand side in our console represents all the articles. So first we're looping through node 0. And I'm getting out of it data articles, this will be zero, title, putting that in an H2. So you can see here the out variable contains a whole bunch of these H2s with the class item, the onClick action display story X, and then the title. This is a very important line of code. The loop actually builds out a whole bunch of these. Let's just add right here a console log to out. So I want you to see what that's actually doing. So we'll refresh. And here is the console log for out. We zoom in on that. You can see what it's done is it's created the HTML for what you see on the right, including on-click actions for display story zero, display story one, display story three, display story four. And what this corresponds to is the items you see here. So if I click on the first one, a Game of Thrones, a fan images, etc., you can see the story here. This display story zero, this function runs on a click. And that's what causes this to happen. That's what causes our second screen to run with the story information, right? It's that display story one, etc. So that's being all built here, all this HTML and the variable out. Then we're going to get the element news. Now, don't forget in our HTML, we have clock, news, and detail. So we're getting news, and we're going to put all of that HTML that you can see right here into news. That's what gives us this display here of all the different news items that's created by that HTML. This less catch here, this is the last part of the promise that deals with the promise, it deals with any errors, and just simply alerts out any error that comes from talking to the news API. All right, so now this display story function right here runs anytime any of the stories are clicked. There's the display story function. Anytime one of the stories are clicked, display story is run. And what's passed to display story is the number of the story that you want from 0 to 19. So that's passed to display story. 
So display story gets that number as an argument. And then remember that we stored all of this data that came back from the JSON object in an array called story array, right? This array of stories. In fact, we could interrogate our console here. And if we asked for story array, you can see it right here. So there's the array of stories. So when this is clicked on, we need to get from the story array, if let's say it's story zero, we're going to get story array, the articles node, right? Right here, because they're all inside the articles node. Articles right there. The story number, so zero, one, two, three, we're going to get the title. We're going to get the URL for the image. We're going to get the source and then we're going to get the name, because in order to get the source, you've got to go into source.source.name, like that. And then we'll get the content, which is the actual story text. Once again, I'm going to use these variables that I've just created by taking data from the actual array of the stories, the title, image, source, and content, and I'm going to use string interpolation to create the actual story HTML, putting it in a logical division whose ID is touch, on click close touch, right? Because anytime we click on that, it actually closes. So we'll run the close touch function. And then we have the story title right here, the image, which comes from the image URL. So we're adding the URL right there from the image variable with a class for styling. And then we have the source, and then we have the content. So that's the HTML that makes up this page that appears dynamically when the user clicks on the story. Now, the only other thing we've got to do is we've got to lose the display of the clock and lose the display of all the news items on the click. So a news item has been clicked. We're going to go ahead and set the URL detail to out. We're going to set the div clock to style.display.none to make it disappear and news to style.display.none to make it disappear. If you're using a framework, well, by the way, like jQuery, this is a little bit easier because they have a page construction and you can turn the pages on and off. You can even change them with some effects. But I'm trying to use mostly vanilla JavaScript here. So I'm simply making the, the individual logical divisions appear and disappear. All right, so then what, right now, because we're in the status, right, the new story is displaying the variable out. Right there it is. We've got the image, we've got the story, but we have this close touch event whenever I click it. So when I click it, close touch runs, and close touch goes ahead and gets that detail div and deletes the content. And then it displays the clock and the news again by setting style display to block. So that's close touch. So there you have it, a fairly simple app that allows you to display a clock and news stories, the type of thing that might be on your phone, on your bedside table when you're asleep. So you can get up and immediately check the news. Hopefully you've learned something about how APIs allow you to get up-to-date information and the date object in JavaScript. Thanks for watching. Don't forget, if you enjoy these videos, go ahead and hit the like button, leave a comment and let me know you liked it, and subscribe to the channel. I'm Mark Lassoff. I'll see you soon.